Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jan Brugård and with me today, I have my colleague Anke Nike. We will Hi, be, everybody. yeah, yes. Uh, we will be presenting uh, some features of System Modeler today. Right now system. here I'm, I'm flying what is over. It, yeah? <laughs> this is Modeler. not System Modeler. No, no, well, but we'll get back to that. Uh, <laughs> so right now we're flying over, over Linköping where our head office is for the System Modeler development, Lake Roxen. Um, and uh, there's, there's actually a specific reason why I began with this, this flight. And as, as Anket pointed out, it's, it's not really system model we're seeing, but that's what we were going to talk about. But um, let me just hand this over to uh, Anket and he will give you an introduction. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Yes. Yes, uh, so thank you, Jan. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Ankit. Uh, Applications engineer in the Wolfram System Modeler team. Uh, before we begin this presentation on latest features in System Modeler, uh, for those of you who are new to System Modeler, I just wanted to give a brief introduction to it. So what is System Modeler? Uh, system Modeler is basically a modeling and simulation tool uh, that can be used to model dynamic systems. Uh, this dynamic systems can range from, let's say, an automobile to uh, something from life, life sciences, like how does a drug uh, behave in a body, or it can be from like how a uh, windmill uh, behaves in case of uh, in case of wind loads, and there is and so many different other domains. Uh, in today's presentation, we will uh, take examples from. Uh, from the energy domain, from a business domain. And finally, we will uh, look at some models from the aircraft modeling domain. So uh, before we look into the features, uh, let me open up system modeler so that we can start up with a simple example. So people who are new to system modeler, uh, this is the uh, modeling interface of system modeler where you can see a canvas with some components in it. So what's happening in this model? Here, uh, we have two different bodies. And this uh, two different bodies are maintained at different temperatures. And there is a heat transfer operating between these two bodies by uh, a body radiation component. So when you model in system modeler, uh, you have a uh, uh, library of uh, various of hundreds of pre-built components, which you can which you can easily drag and drop and create such systems. For this example, as you can see in this library, we have different sub-libraries ranging from electrical, mechanics, fluid, and thermal sub-libraries. For this example, uh, I have used the heat transfer library. Let's say uh, you want to add another uh, mode of heat transfer between these two bodies. Let's say you want to add uh, a heat conduction between, between these two bodies. So what you, could, what you would do is you would go to this sub-library and drag uh, this heat conductor element to the screen and then choose the connection line tool and just uh, click the two ports. And now the model is complete. So now just by dragging a component and connecting with the two bodies, you have a model of where you, where you have a heat transfer process where you are transferring heat by conduction and radiation. Let me give it a value, let's say one. Now my model is ready. The next thing that I want to do is I want to simulate this model and try to see how the heat transfer operates uh, how the heat transfer happens. So just to let you know, I have given some initial condition to my two bodies. The first heat capacitor is maintained at 20 degrees centigrade, and the second heat capacitor is maintained at 120 degrees centigrade. So to, uh, to simulate this model, you just have to press the simulate button, which you can see as the play button on this on the toolbar. Once you click the simulate button, 
you are uh, you enter the uh, the simulation center view. Uh, this is a view where you can explore the different the values of different variables. For instance, uh, in this model, uh, here you can see the how the temperature of the two bodies is changing. So heat capacitor two dot T is cooling, and heat capacitor one dot T is is being heated until they reach a uh, steady state temperature. In this view, uh, you have access to uh, the, all the variables uh, present in the components. For instance, the body radiation component has variables like change in temperature. Uh, it has the net radiation conductance values and various and, and others. Finally, one last thing that I wanted to mention is in this view, uh, you can also test different scenarios. For instance, you can, uh, what would happen if the heat conduction value increases? So let's say you want to have it as 10 watt per Kelvin, and then you can rerun. And then you can see how, uh, how, the, uh, the, how it quickly reaches a steady state temperature. So uh, this was a very short uh, introduction to the different interfaces uh, of system modeler, the modeling and the simulation interface. Uh, I hope this would give you uh, some background so that you can uh, understand when, when we explain or when we show the new features uh, in system modeler. Uh, to give you, before we start giving you concrete examples, I wanted uh, to give you an overview of the things that has happened in the last year. Uh, so in the last year, we have, uh, we have worked on several uh, new features that, uh, that are targeted at uh, reducing your design time, uh, as well as we have added different uh, Wolfram language functions, which should help you analyze and quickly design systems. For instance, uh, here I'm uh, looking at the what is new web page of Fulton System Modeler. And here you can see the different things that we have worked on. Uh, we, we have worked on how, how to make the simulation results more interactive, how to work on, like how can you quantify uh, your control system response, or how can you create automatically create dashboards and various other uh, features. So if you want to have a overview of what are the new things, you can refer to it. In this presentation, we will uh, use uh, three different examples and we will try to cover some of these features. Also, over the last year, we have added uh, different blocks, which are basically customer stories and, and, and various workflows. So for instance, we have a blog on how to uh, work with the aircraft library or how to uh, model a software as a service companies and such. And finally, we have also released uh, various new libraries like the aircraft library for industrial users, the college mechanical engineering library for students and, and various other libraries. Uh, also, one thing to note is uh, since uh, version 13.2, we have also made our hydraulic and communication libraries like OPC Classic and OPC UA libraries free for all users. So you can, uh, so, so there, is no, uh, there is no hurdle for our users to try out uh, different uh, new, new modeling techniques. Okay, so that was a, a brief overview of what is system modeler and uh, like what are the new features and new things that we have been uh, doing. But now let's start into getting something more concrete. And now I will hand it over to Jan, uh, who, will, uh, who will give you a cool example from the energy domain. Over to you, Jan. Thank you, Ankit. So um, as said, uh, we're going to talk about an example from the energy domain. Um, 
for those of you that uh, attended the, the Wolfram Technology Conference uh, this fall or, or follow the uh, presentation on sustainable energy yesterday, uh, you saw me presenting an example where we modeled the electric grid of Sweden in a very sort of basic way. We, we reduced the number of cities in Sweden to four, Luleå, Sundsvall, Stockholm, and Malmö, and the number of power suppliers to three, a hydroelectric plant, a nuclear power plant, and a wind power plant. And based on that, we did simulations and, and forecasting to understand the, the energy production of of Sweden. Um, so, um, of course, in, in this case, one of the things that when you model this is the connection of, of how do you get things into model as, as data. So the wind power, how much that generates, of course, depends on the wind. Uh, and that's a pretty nice thing that you can can do in the, uh, in the system modeler. So you can uh, look at, so let, let me open this in System Modeler, by the way. There you go. So here we have, have the, the model in System Modeler and similar to the drag and drop that Ankit just showed. Uh, this is drag and drop together, just without components. Uh, but one thing we can see here is that it has a wind velocity into the, wind, uh, to the power plant here. And, and that is actually generated from uh, uh, generated da data from uh, Mathematica using the Wolfram language. So basically what, what was done was to query about the wind speed in Munsteros uh, at a certain date. Here I put October 10. I, I, I really don't remember which date it is. And this of course are things that you that, that you've seen before if you used uh, Use, use the Mathematica, but the nice thing here is that you can easily use that to connect into a model. Now, um, this is using uh, data that already exists, historical data, but sometimes you don't. You want to forecast something, and a way to do that might be, or or you want to create something more intelligent. A way to do that is, of course, to to have something that would be an input through a neural net. So I thought I'd change, show that in, instead because, because we have a new workflow for integrating neural networks into the system models. So for that, I made a very small uh, example, uh, simple here. We have an outside temperature that we just generated based on, on data acquired uh, in Mathematica that goes into to a building. And then we have a controller that tries to, to monitor the air conditioning system. So this is the system. It's really simple. Um, if I if I look at that, if I would click into this building here, we can see that it has different things like the air conditioner. It has walls and so on. It also has something here says heat says load with a parameter heat load. So what that that uh, tries to add to the model is some way of of saying how much heat load or heating can we expect from things like people in the building or appliances in the building and so on. And in this case, it's done as just some guess value. So, so let me just simulate that so you, so you see. And by the way, uh, it, let's go back here. Uh, you saw uh, Anket doing a model with, he started here with, with uh, these guys here, which are thermal capacitors, right? And and change. And this this reuses this to get the room inertia, but then it connects it to other systems. So it's more of a multi-domain system that that doesn't stick to only thermal uh, modeling. Anyways, let's let's get this going. The plots you're seeing here are are I'll, I'll get back to those if my memory doesn't fail me. Okay, so here we see it. Uh, what we see here is ambient temperature during one day, 24 hours, and then the room temperature. So we see how it's switching on and off here because it's an on-off controller that basically whenever it, it goes below uh, a certain value, we start to heat and whenever it goes under, we start to cool down. And, and, and that way we, we try to maintain the temperature around some desired 
temperature. In this case, it seems to be 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, but now, uh, of course, there, there might be things like um, you might be interested in how much energy is, is spent. Here we can see over the, that day it was 50 kilowatt hours spent for, for this entire building. Um, and then you can start to play around with things. And here we see something new, something that added from, from Sysoma 13 too. We can add things that are similar to the manipulates of Wolfram language, and you actually can generate the manipulates from this very easily. I, th I, th I think you will get back to that, right, uh, Anket? Uh, show how, how it relates to, to manipulates in, in uh, yes. Mathematica. Right, good. So um, if we look here, we can change things. Like right now, we have a win. It only has one window, this, this uh, um, floor that we're looking at. But we can say, put it to the south, and then it will change slightly. Apparently, this date didn't, didn't make substantial difference. And we can slide things here and see how would the uh, different uh, factors uh, change behavior, and that will immediately update the things. Right. Um, so while while this explorer thing is new, um, one thing I said, what happens if uh, I, um, I also said here that we had this constant value that we were trying to give to say this is the heat load from uh, that added from people and so on. But what if we could could give a better estimate of that? One way to do that would be to collect data. So let's start here. I import some data from, you see here, machine learning databases. So it's a public available uh, databases on with different data. And in this case, we have some data here with columns x1, x, x2, to Y2, doesn't say what it is here, but there's documentation telling us what, what it is. So we read this data into Mathematica, right? And then we want to process this data in some way. So you saw these X1s, X2s, and so on. Let me just evaluate this entire section. So by reading the documentation, we could see that X1 actually corresponds to relative compactness and so on. So we create these ones, and with a simple rule here, association thread, we will uh, rename this table, and we get something more understandable. So the type of data we have here is uh, relative compact compactness, surface area, wall area, and so on. So different properties of buildings. And this is collected for 1,296 uh, rows it seemed to be, so, so 1,296 buildings, I guess then, uh, to get some statistics. Um, and then once we have these statistics, we can start to do things here. We're cleaning up the data a bit. Well, let's skip that. Now what we can do instead is we can use this data and divide it into two different parts, one to train, and want to validate our trained neural nets, right? So let's do that. So now we've done that, uh, divided it into that, and we'll uh, then use this to train a neural net. Here we train for 120 seconds. We can set how long time we want to train. And of course, the longer we train, the, the better we will, uh, better result we will get. Uh, so we have the, the da data here for the net, the train data, and then uh, out here comes something showing how close we are, how how, how big of a, oh how how big of an error we have. So how close are we to actually getting something that is uh, is working fine in predicting, um, in this case, uh, the the total energy from produced. Uh, or power uh, produced by, by people uh, in buildings, depending on properties of that building. So we sort of try to, properties of the building, use that to predict how much we can expect from, from surround, surrounding heating. So we do that. Let me stop that. Like 120 seconds is a bit too long. So, okay. So, so now when we stop that, we'll take 
the, the value, whatever it, it, it came to here, will be our trained data. So we have a trained neural net. And now to the new thing in System Modeler. So what you can do now is first we I'll, I'll extract the neural net that we trained here. I just call that Fnet. So we have this net chain here. And with create system model, the functions you have previously been able to use, for instance, to, to create models from, from state space models, from equations and so on in Mathematica and generate system modeler models from that, now it accepts neural nets. So we add this uh, Fnet, we will create something called MyNet, and, uh, and then we say where to place uh, associated files. So I shift, shift enter here. And get my net produced. So now I have a trained net that predicts, based on some factors, it predicts this uh, uh, power load that we would like to use in our model. So let's see here, if it wants to scroll down, no. So let's do it this way then, go directly here. So here um, we have the, um, the model that I started with, but I prepared a bit. So I prepared it so I can switch here. I can redeclare this from where I use this guesstimate of, of, of uh, the power, I will now use the neural net instead. So I changed here, neural net, and you will see that the icon changes. However, if I open this, we can see that something is missing here. We have the same model as before. And remember here we had just an input, uh, a constant input that went directly here. Now what I will add here is this my net that we just produced. Just like that, right? So now I can connect this. So we'll... Connect that one, and we connect this one. So now we have, based on some properties, we can see here relative compactness, surface area, wall area, that you can set as a user here. It will use this neural net to predict your heat heat factor, heat power factor from, from people uh, and other appliances, other things that, that might heat up, uh, add heat to your building. And we can see those parameters here, but let's, let me just simulate this again. But let's do this. Let's keep this first. Uh, I pin this so we don't overwrite it. And then we'll go back to this model here. So now this model, if I double click here, you can see that now we have this, this neural net in it. So let's go back and simulate. And now with the values, it actually gives the exact same results because I set it up with the, with the, with the, with the estimated thing that happened to be corresponding to my, my standard settings here for the model. But now uh, suddenly things like surface area and roof area are actually included not only in the model of the house, but in the prediction of this added load. So when I start to play around here, uh, it's no longer exactly the same. So let's change this to north. Uh, let's perhaps do this. Uh, yeah, we'll do that later. So, and we change the roof area, make that smaller. Surface area of the house, make that smaller. And we'll give slightly different behavior. In all cases, we can see that the controller or the the AC system manages to keep our temperature around uh, the value you want. But it actually behaves a slightly different depending on the settings. But perhaps that's easier to see if we look at the cumulative uh, energy in kilowatt hours. So here we have whatever it costs in this case. And if I go over to this pin version and I put that on top, 
we can see that the previous version cost a lot more. Uh, so this way we can now compare and see, uh, start to change. Let's say now that we change the surface area here. And uh, let's do this. We, we, uh, oh, that was the, the old one. We should do this on this one, sorry, where it actually has more. So that, that you saw that on the old model didn't make much of an effect. On this one, instead, it should sort of hopefully have more effect. Then you see that that sort of that this it separates more here between them. Um, good. Um, so um, this is a pretty nice way to combine your more deterministic physics-based models with uh, with neural nets and expand the use of of uh, of your or expand the, the scope of your models. Um, there are plenty of material that we can, we'll post to you for additional resources on, on this. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll leave it over again to uh, to Anket, who will talk a bit about software as a system uh, and how you can model something like that. Thank you, Jan. Uh, as you said, like uh, uh, you you showed you have showed a nice example based on physics, but is it that but is it a requirement that we need uh, we can only model uh, models based on physics, or we can also model uh, social systems or various other kind of uh, systems? And the answer is yes. Uh, we can uh, model different. <laughs> Uh, types of systems, like we can model the various business processes or uh, uh, and other social systems. And to do that, uh, for explaining this uh, example on software as a service, uh, I will use the business simulation library uh, to give a brief background, like uh, why, how or before I go to the main example, I want to take a detour and try to come up with a very simple example of how you can use. Oh, can, I, I, can I can I yes. stop you a bit there? Can you can you zoom in a bit on on that uh, image because it's very small? Oh, okay. Yes, is this fine now? Yes, that's that's better. Oh. Then I think people can see. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, so Thanks. here's a simple uh, example uh, from this from this domain. Uh, let's say you are starting a manufacturing company and you want to figure out like as you start uh, uh, building up on uh, building up your company how much inventory uh, you are going to have and you want to understand so that you can find a warehouse where you can store those inventories so for a process that you have not started you want to model how things would look like and here is this example here, this model of a simple production chain where you have uh, something called a producing block uh, through which uh, you have a, you give a production rate and then you store it in a component called inventory from this inventory uh, you have uh, you have a, a, a purchase uh, profile and this purchase profile ships the inventory to your customer and then your product has let's say a uh, life of five years after which it is scrapped and it goes to the scrapyard. So here is a simple like simple uh, production chain of a product, how it starts, how it's being produced, shipped and scrapped. Using this model, uh, then you can simulate it, let's say for uh, here, I've simulated for 60 months and here you can see, uh, let me zoom in, yes. So here you can see the blue curve shows how over the given span of time, the installed base is like how many products you have shipped to your customers. And here you can see how is the inventory level changing over time. So as you start, you start building upon your inventories and you can say that when everything is stable, you reach a constant inventory of let's say 1,200 or 500 uh, products. So uh, so, by this way, you can uh, you can test different uh, purchase profile, or you can 
try to model a market demand and you can try to see how the inventory profile uh, is changing and then you can plan for your warehouse accordingly. And in this plot uh, is basically the di different demands and different rates I have used to model that. As you can see, the production was constant and here for initial years I was not shipping and then I gradually started shipping at, and after which I reached a steady rate. And here is the scrapping thing, right? So, uh, and to do this kind of models in the business simulation library has uh, various components that help that you can directly use. So it's not something that you have to start making your custom components. You can directly uh, readily use the built-in components from there. And here you have the, diff the examples package where you can see there are examples like production chain, uh, at the SIR model or love hit dynamics, Lotka Volterra systems, which is a very popular system in system dynamics. So you, there are various uh, examples in this library that you can use it, use as template and build upon uh, your so, 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 so those that you mentioned here seem to be quite small examples, but I assume you can do, you yes. have examples of, of, of larger stuff, right? Yes. And that, and here, and now comes to my okay. software as a service okay. company. So just to give, give background, Jan, of how I started with this model, I was watching a uh, shark tank and, uh, I saw, I heard terms like, okay, growth rate, a company is making losses and people are projecting like how much marketing expense do you have? So there were so many different uh, terms when I was looking at this show. And then and I for thought, anyone, anyone joining from, from, from uh, the UK, when he said shark tag, he actually means dragon's den and that's what is named. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I thought, I thought, okay, this looks so. This is a very dynamic process, and uh, like, why not model this process? Model this process of a company and try to see how those numbers uh, gives give us some indication of the different trends of what would happen in the future. And from that question, I started uh, modeling the entire process. So this is the top level view of the model, uh, where you have. But it has different components, but I will not go into all the components. For instance, it has uh, it, it has this flow of uh, customer journey, and I will go into more detail into this, but it also has uh, a block on product development of a software, like how does the number of employees affect the product development or how does uh, the the morale in the among the employees it affects how quickly a product is being developed and so on but for now let me just try to explain the most important most important or the part that i like the most uh, and it's the customer journey which was really new to me so here uh, you can see different uh, components like unaware customer aware customer trial users what is this so uh, this is something called as a sales funnel. Let's say you want to start your own company. Uh, and for your company, uh, once you have a product, there is a target group who are completely unaware that you have created this amazing product. So you start with a target group of, let's say, 10 million customers who are completely unaware. To reach those customers, you would then uh, have Facebook ads, you would have bill ads in billboards and various other ads. And through these ads, you want your target audience to be aware of the product. So here you're moving your unaware customer to an aware customer stage. And once someone knows about your product, uh, they will not directly try it. You have to show them some uh, blocks, some use cases, more, uh, you have to show them more resources so that they are more inclined to try your product. So then you make the aware customer a trial customer. And when you start, when you become a trial customer, you use, there will be a, a group of audience who really like your product and they would become, they would pay once and become occasional users. There will also be a loss of customers at this stage, but 
uh, but I have not shown it in this in this uh, snippet. And from occasional customers, there will be some customers who really love your product, who really see the value in your product, and they become repeat customers. So, and this is how this res the simulation result looks like. And this is for a span of 10 years. And you can see that nothing happens until year one because you have no money to, to spend on advertisement. So theoretically, nobody knows about your product. That's why nothing interesting happens up to year one. And after that, you can see that suddenly people are becoming more aware of your product. And since you have a very nice examples, blocks in place, you're trying to convert a lot of aware customers to trial users. And here is the final thing that gives you money. And that's like how many you could convert to occasional customers and repeat customers. The, different, the difference being, if you have a repeat customer, you gain more. And if you have an occasional customer, you gain less. But uh, so this is uh, the... This was the, uh, you could say, how a sales funnel works like. But of course, my, mod my model is much more than that. Uh, let me just simulate this model and try to see uh, what are the different scenarios I have stored up uh, so that we can test uh, different, uh, like, uh, different strategies. So once I simulate this model. I will just have it at 10 years. So, and I will just give it some design. So it, it's, but it's better to see. So Jan has already introduced you uh, slightly to this new thing. It's the control panels. So as, as my model was a bit complex, it has like hundreds of different parameters. And when you share your models with someone else, you don't want your users to be bogged down with so many different parameters and plots. You want them to give a minimal view so that it's very easy for them to interact with. And that's why we use this explore panel. And it has different uh, control panels like advertising, product pricing, and employees. Let's open the product pricing panel. And here, let's try to, uh, okay, I keep on switching, yes. So now, once we have this model, let's try to test a strategy. So here, let's say one of the questions that comes is, how would a product be priced so that you get the maximum profit or you reach breakdown very fast? That's a, that's a question which people ask and- uh, Or break I even, I guess. Yeah, or break even. It's a question which people ask and everyone has a different answer to it. And I was like, okay, but what is the process? Like, how, what is the process that you are, you are uh, basing your decision on? So then let's look at this process. So for my model, let's say if I have a price of 100, I have used a unit of sharks in this case. So if I have a, a constant price of 100 sharks, and if I simulate my model, you can see that at around uh, seven years, I am reaching the break even. And at the end of 10 years, I have around 103,000 uh, customers. Let's uh, try a different strategy, which you can see a lot of software as a service company do. Like they start uh, selling you the product for free. And after a few years, they put a price on the product. Let's try to see how that scenario would look. So let's say I have a very, uh, I have a minimal uh, uh, price of 10 sharks. And then after, let's say three years, I increase the price, let's say again to 100, uh, uh, 100 sharks. So let's see what happens here. So here you can see uh, that initially you're making loss, but at the third year, you, you start to break even. And, and, and why so? The reason being, uh, as you had a very small uh, price at the start, you were able to uh, reach a lot of customers. A lot of people tried your product and, they, and, and the assumption is that they were hooked by your product. And when you 
charged a price for it they were so hooked that they were not able to move on of course there are some people who which you have lost that's why you have you don't have a constant curve there is a discontinuity here because you are losing a lot of customers as well but still people see people have actually tried your product and they see that there is a value in your product and you can see uh, with this even if the rate of increase in customers is slow you have attained break even and you have around 200000 customers at the end so so this is a this is a at least this is a good insight to start thinking about how you should uh, price your product this is not the the only way you should do it but it shows your trend and it gives your thoughts some numeric values you can quantitatively use this kind of methodology to design finally uh, let's say you have this beautiful model in system modeler but you want to share your model with various other users your friends and you and they don't have system model but they do have the desktop version of mathematica so we, uh, so in the last release cycles we have worked upon this resource function called system model manipulate which as you can see automatically uses the control panels that you have stored in your model this is the advertising and let me get back to the pricing so here you can see you have a nice manipulate uh, with all the uh, all the data uh, from the control panels and then this one you can easily share with others like just by a single line of code where you're just defining the model name and it's become so easy for for your users to get insight from it right i think i am taking a lot of time yaar so i will quickly uh, finish by uh, pointing you to some good learning resources like we have a blog exactly on this model which came up like one week or two week back uh, which you can refer if you want to know more about it all the models they are shared from that blog and also there are various presentations on this way of modeling which is called system dynamics and there are various presentations and examples which you can refer to to learn more about it and of course if you have any question feel free to drop us a mail that's fine but but or, or, or ask at the moment as people people are actually asking at the moment and and we oh, will after okay. my part i i will be we will be answering together on on uh, those questions so keep on uh, asking uh, yes in the chat nice okay now uh, now to answer the question that yan to answer my question that yan started with like what was that yan like what were we how are you playing with this aircraft thing can you tell us more about it yeah uh, so let's uh, go back to to my screen here there you go now you should see my screen and let's go from software as a service to aircraft um but yes before we do that uh, yes the reminder uh, keep posting uh, questions we will answer them uh, after this section of the aircraft and uh, and then also um, as you saw we have references and so on in in the notebook um this notebook will be posted for you in um, so you will be linked from from youtube to a community post where you can can get the whole notebook and and get all the information afterwards um anyway so so let's let's look at the aircraft library i started to fly around there uh, using actually this joystick so so the nice thing with with developing models is that you, you can play a bit also right um and to give a bit of introduction to to uh, to this we um this fall we uh, released a new library for aircraft modeling um the models can include things like aerodynamics uh, uh, forces uh, and and both locally on on the different surfaces as well on uh, as other properties um and the idea with it is to make it easy to to uh, do quick testings of both completely new new uh, concepts new designs but also alterations of designs that you you might be doing 
Um, so, for instance, if you're looking into developing an, uh, an electric aircraft at the moment, you would like to test that and see its performance. So that, that's the, the, the basic idea behind the library. Uh, but let me start with this example here. Um, perhaps increase that a bit, I guess. Something like that. Is uh, this scenario here we have, uh, it says Pipistrel Alpha Electro. Uh, Pipistrel Alpha Electro is, is um, an electric aircraft. And here over we can see another aircraft, uh, Schweitzer SGS-136. That's a quite old aircraft and very different uh, because it's a glider. Uh, so what we'll be doing is towing this uh, aircraft with this towing rope here. And they are both controlled by some autopilots here. Let, let me just uh, go, go from there and, uh, and uh, look at this model uh, in the library, actually. So uh, let's see here. Examples, and I'm starting to open the library here. You see there are a few examples, and here's the glider tow. So I open that here, and, and you see the same things. If I go in and click on one of these, you can see there's a bunch of tabs. There's there's tons of things you can set to get the the exact properties of of your aircraft. Um, there are those pre-designed, like the Pipistrel, that you can just use. It's ready ready set up and parameterized. But if you want to to make your own, you can parameterize and you can change it sort of as you want. You can change engines. You can change. Uh, um, uh, propulsion system, uh, the propulsion system as a whole, with with from electrical to electrical, from from uh, turboprop and so on. Um, but let's yeah, let's just simulate this. And of course, while, while this is simulating, let's let, let, let's actually oh sorry, go back here. Um, we will we'll go back into the question because I have one of the questions we we got in the early presentation was on uh, on uh, control system design and how, how you design controller and of course that relates to the autopilots and here we have an autopilot and we see it has a bunch of PID controllers uh, to control um, the the commands for for um, the throttle uh, and rudder and so on. And in comes uh, come, comes things like the alt the commanded altitude, velocity, and so on. So the question was, how do we design this? And and uh, I'll uh, I'll give this to you as an exercise, Ankit, to after this presentation show something to show a bit about control design and and uh, mathematics. So I hope you can can do that. Uh, that was kind of me, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Anyways, let's uh, this. Okay, so it's running a bit slower now when when we have Zoom the Zoom session uh, running at the same time. So that was uh, odd. Uh, I hope I guess that's that's the reason. Um, but there you go. Now now it will start simulating. Let let me under under uh, until it's done. Um, Zoom consumes a bit too much power every now and then. Show a bit more about the library. So we have here. Uh, it says physical, and it says state space. So traditionally, if you use uh, traditional tools, you would have state space representations of your aircrafts when modeling. However, the problem with the state space representation is that you have a, a linearized version that that will not give you full uh, the the full correct physical properties of the aircraft. So so the state space part here are made as a reference more of two uh, legacy models, how they were used to be made before. The physical models here, they are more traditional uh, models from uh, as, as we typically do in system modeler with the actual equations. So if we, if we go in here, we can see there's a fixed wing uh, package and that package will have, for instance, the Boeing 737, which happened to be the one I started flying there with, with uh, flight gear. So uh, if I open this, uh, I can 
can then uh, see that it has propulsion surfaces body and I can can go in and, and, and look at okay how is the propulsion made in this case it has two engines you can sort of see by the grade out here is made so you can configure and activate more engines uh, if you like or just make it with one engine and see how that would perform you can switch the engine types uh, so let's see if I, let's go propulsion here uh, you can see that it says, okay, it's, is it wing mounted um, and or not? Uh, so basically, how 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 are the um, engines mounted <laughs> to our aircraft? Sorry for that. Uh, so on. Um, so great. So that's the way it's it's built up. So it's it's built up as as any other other uh, library that you used in system model before. Yes, it happens to be aircrafts. Um, here you go. Here we have the simulation done for uh, 25 minutes. If we look at the curves here, we see that a red and, a, and an orange one here. Um, and we see that there are different things on top here because we have actually uh, the reference altitude and the actual altitude. So you can see here, if you look closely, let me just zoom into that part. We can see that there's a deviation between the reference altitude and the actual altitude of, in this case, the sway, sway, the, the glider. So just as anything else here, you would be able to go around and and uh, and uh, test around. And again, you can see this, uh, this uh, control panels where we can change things. In this case, it's set up to change the release height for, for the glider and, and tone rope length and so on. But I, let, let's not go too much into details here. Uh, instead, I'll uh, I'll open the visualization as it's seen in the, in the system modeler. So here we have the two aircraft, and rather than actually running the simulation real time, let me just pull you through here in some a bit faster speed. So you see here, it's towing uh, the aircraft, and what we can see meanwhile is that the actual force is acting on different surfaces. Are illustrated. This is, of course, something you can turn on and off as you as you like. But it shows the the lift lifting for lift forces and so on on your aircraft. Uh, and then we'll let's proceed here. Seems like nothing is happening, and it's because we locked into to the glider and it's just going steady. But here we see now something starts happening. So let's play from here. So now we see that the glider is released. And we start flying around, just gliding uh, in the middle of air. Right. And that's the way a traditional uh, simulation in system model would look like when you animate, right? So it's, it's a rather simple uh, animation environment because we're not really, it's not a game we're producing. We're doing this to illustrate things like the forces here. Um, so why did I start with with uh, something with a completely different looks with flight gear? Well, the thing is, once you produced one of these, you can you can use that and connect to different things. In the case I did in the beginning, I actually used the system model, and I can show which system model I used. I used. Uh, let's go here and find this one here, Boeing seven three seven. I use this model here, uh, where you see joystick input uh, and some some very sim simple logic to to uh, um, interpret the signals from from the joystick. That goes into the autopilot. The autopilot uh, then sends information to the aircraft that will be will uh, um, be controlled accordingly or fly accordingly. Of course, that is fed back into the autopilot, its position and so on, so the autopilot knows how to, to handle that and so on. Once you've done that, and here you can see the, 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 the trick here, it's, it has something called FDMTX1. That's actually a block that we added here to connect it to flight gear. So now flight gear, when I run flight gear, as I did in the beginning, uh, I shut it down now, so I won't open it again. So, so when I run flight gear, and system order at the same time, it will just fly 
accordingly whatever I do in this model. So what we were visualizing in flight gear was the actual simulation of system modeler. Um, and if you want to see what we actually, what actually, what I was actually doing, I can go, this was the simulation that ran when, when we saw the flight gear stuff. So uh, you might remember this from early on in the, in, in, in the presentation that, that, that you, you got a quick view of this. Uh, here you have whatever I did with a joystick. So I started to move around a bit here, trying to show you lean chopping. And then after a while I released it and started talking a bit with, with Anket, if I remember correctly. And and then, but then you can go and see the different different things. Like if I double click here, uh, okay, that was zoomed into a very. So I stopped the simulation beforehand. Uh, um, I can see things like in this case, uh, uh, throttle position um, for it and so on. But I can see fuel consumption and and different things. So this way I can not, it's not only a game sort of model developed for, for, for a game engine, it's actually something that you can draw, uh, draw uh, real conclusions for uh, when, uh, when designing an aircraft. So, so with that, I think I'll leave over to, to you again, Anket. And, and um, yeah, or let me just uh, remind you again that we have a learn more section uh, with, things here that you can download to get more resources uh, of different kinds. But with that, I'll, I'll leave over for, for you again, Anket, and, and give you the question about uh, control design and, and how that would be made. Right. Okay, let me try to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> so over the past few releases, uh, we have been working on various, on improving the workflows, like how would you use a model and Mathematica together to quickly come up with uh, in, uh, initially a first tuned version uh, of your of your model so i will s there are various examples but i will start i will try to explain or show you an example of a model predictive control that was uh, released in 13.2 so uh, now let's say here uh, i have a my control problem is I want to control the speed of DC motor. Can, can you zoom in a bit? Yes. Yes. Is this fine? Or yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think that that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here, so what uh, to let's say I want to control the speed of this DC motor. So I start by modeling a simple uh, like electric and mechanical, electromechanical model of a DC motor, as you can see here. Once I have this model, uh, as you can, as you all know that in order to uh, work with control systems, a lot of the theory is based upon a linearized model. So the, the model that we create is a nonlinear model, but what we do is we linearize the model about the initial position or about any operating point or equilibrium point. In this case, I'm I'm linearizing my DC motor about the initial point. And you can hear, see the state space representation at that instant. And once I have that, then uh, I can, then I s give some specifications, like uh, I give a sampling period and I uh, give like, what is the output that I want to track? In this case, W, which means the speed of uh, the DC motor. And here, and since it's a predictive control, I also need to give a time horizon. In this case, I've given a time horizon of three, which means you predict for three future steps. Then in the next step, you again rectify yourself and, and update the control logic. And the good thing with MPC control is you can actually give constraints, which is really important because sometimes you, you end up giving too high input and some of the physical constraints are not uh, uh, are not followed. For instance, I want to uh, control the amount of current that is flowing in my circuit. So I give it a range like zero to one ampere. And then we have this new model predictive controller function where you just specify uh, the specification, the the model and the uh, the constraint. 
And what it does is it gives you the MPC uh, controller, the first version of the MPC controller. And then you can use a connect system model controller to automatically connect your controller with the plant. So with this function, you get a controlled system. And once you use a control system, let me, in this step, what I've done is I'm given it a reference signal and let's see how the system behaves. So here you can see uh, the blue line shows uh, the actual velocity and one is the reference that I've given. Initially, my shaft was at rest. So there was, so it starts with zero and I give it a reference of one radian per second. And you can see how uh, the speed is trying to, is, is attaining the reference speed here. And then you can, uh, so so this shows that the model is uh, is able to attain the reference speed, but what about the current? So once you plot this current, you can see that the value of the current is like 0 0.04 for my toy example here. So you can see that it's below uh, uh, one ampere and above zero. So it's it's respecting uh, my niche, my constraints. And one thing, one new thing that we have also added in the last release is once you, when you are working with control systems, you have to work with different control philosophies or different control logic. And the thing is, once you test a control logic, you want to compare to different uh, control logics. And to easily compare that, you need some parameters, some performance parameters for a logic. So we have this new system model measurements, which gives you this performance parameters. For instance, in my previous curve, like here you can see my the settling time of 30 seconds. So my system settled down at 28.6 seconds. And also there was an overshoot of 10.7%. For some systems, it might be tolerable. For some systems, it might not be tolerable. So, so if you want to compare two different control logic, you can uh, quickly do that using this new uh, system model measurements function. But this was on MPC. If you are working on, uh, we also have examples, uh, which you can find it out in our web page, where if you are working on pole placement philosophy, then we have this uh, hovering control of a submarine, which is working like a regulator. You're trying to maintain it at a constant position. And here you can see that you have used, we have used the uh, state feedback gains. Now function. this is very small. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Yes, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> uh, so then you have this state feedback gains thing where you can use the pole placement uh, control design philosophy. And then you can use the same connect system model controller to give you a controlled system. And then you can see how, uh, how an uncontrolled system would behave and the orange one, how a controlled system would behave. Similarly, so so uh, so in general, uh, so we we have other questions too here to, to get to get during time. So so if I would summarize this a bit, is that there are different ways to, to do the the controllers, uh, and uh, there will be linked examples to that. Uh, and this is one thing we're also adding new features all the time on on the control design and automizing it more and more for you. So it should be as smooth and, and simple as possible, uh, and typically. Well, that part, you, you have the system model, developed the system model, and then you do the control design in the Wolfram language, as you saw here in the examples. Um, if you keep sharing here, I'll, 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 I'll see the questions, uh, some of the questions here, uh, uh, Ankit. Um, and let, yeah, okay, so there's one here that I, I, I think I can answer directly. It's on the... Uh, um, Somebody thought it was nice to see discontinuity, discontinuities uh, uh, getting modeled, and uh, then asking if there, if it's if these variables can be integer based, and yes, they can. Uh, so nothing such a fractional number. Yes, you can, and and I don't know if you already happen to have an example for that. You can, uh, unget or not. Uh, uh uh, for business, uh, for business case, uh, I don't have an example right away. No, for you... for any case. So, so, but but anyway. So so let let's let's just say it, it it does work. We can we can post the examples of that afterwards. You can even do let's say enumerations rather than than referring to uh, so rather than having one two three, they will be called. Yeah, you could see see, see the north south west. 
uh, that I had in my model that actually corresponds to integer values uh, four, three, two, one in uh, in some order. Uh, so so that's actual integer values representing that in the model, but they are then uh, enumerated with some some name that is more easily recognizable for for you as a user. Right. Um, we have uh, uh, also a question in, in finance related. That perhaps is yes. something you can answer. You, you've seen that on time for value of money, interest. Yes, uh, yes. I, I don't have an example, but I do have a component. Uh, so here uh, in the business simulation library, you have uh, information processing sub library, which has uh, the various financial related terms like calculating present value, time value of money, trend, trend-based forecast. So these are the things which can help you in discounting and all uh, and those time-related things. Uh, and and, and yeah. you said you were using sharks uh, in, in your model. So I assume that means that you, you created that that as your own unit in the model and then use that, right? Yes, yes. So I used a custom unit. Yeah. So, so, case. so with that, it is possible to do custom units. So, if there is a unit you're missing, then you can define it yourself. And and whether that's sharks or or dragons, or some other unit, you are perfectly welcome to 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 add that to your models, or you use built-in SI units and other units. Um, where can I get resources for getting started with multi-body modeling? That would be Wolfram U, per, uh, I, I assume, is the best place to start, right, Ankit? Uh, yes, Wolfram U is a good place to start. But uh, from my personal experience, uh, if you want to start with multi-body modeling, uh, I would recommend uh, that you start with the planar mechanics uh, library uh, because if you start working with multi-body directly, uh, it's it's a three-dimensional thing. So there are a lot of, uh, uh, there is one more dimension to it. So it makes it a bit complicated. I would recommend start playing with planar, planar, planar mechanics so that, and it uses the same philosophy as the multi-body uh, right. library, but it's easy to start and you will, you will it would be a nice, nice transition from this stage to the multi-body stage. Uh, that's my experience, but Jan, you might have uh, other experience uh, or other comments. No, the, the, the thing is uh, from back when I, I, I learned uh, how to do multi-body, there there's a lot more and better resources than, than back then. But okay. uh, again, uh, can you show uh, how to how to get to Vol from you? I think we we, uh, yes. we actually have that in the in the uh, I will just in do... the notebook too, but we can just show here. So if you search yes. for Wolfram U as Ankit did here. Yes. Um, and then I can there, go for yeah, modeling yeah. and simulation. So there's a specific section here. And and then here there are um, mm. different, you have the, the, the introductory courses, but also some specific. And I think there are, uh, yes. the, there should be one list here that it's is- Multi-body modeling yeah. and simulation. So that's design. one example. And, and, then my, and I think there are a few others. Uh, and, and which which of these would be the best one for you to start with depends a bit on where you're coming from. Um, but yeah, so so probably the one that that Ankit showed there is is a good starting place after you uh, when you start with the multibody itself. Um, okay, let's see here uh, and 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 keep coming with questions if if you have any more questions. Uh, other components which may help model the effects of EM wave on the polarization of air molecules. Uh, not built in, um, and I don't know if there's any third party. This is completely outside the scope of what I, I, I typically do. So so I, I don't know that there are third party libraries that might do this. I, I, um, I don't know any, but I, I can't say that it doesn't exist. Uh, you just can say that I don't know if there is. But that, yeah. that 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 yeah. that brings to a question, Jan. Like, can people use only libraries available in our library store, or can people use other libraries? Like, where can people yeah. find libraries? Yeah, of course. There, there, there's a lot of so. So this uses the Modelica technology, and there's a lot of of libraries. Some of them, some some of them are uh, current, updated. Others uh, not. So you have to find the robust, good libraries, and then you can can try those. And that's GitHub things like that, you might find additional libraries. 
um, and um, and of course, if if you have developed the library, you can also share that with uh, with other users. Um, right. By the way, I don't know if you mentioned that when I was reading when I was uh, I w when you were presenting the control design part. I was reading the question, so I missed if you met, if you pointed out that what we were looking at was uh, the cloud notebook. Uh, oh yes. So what that. we are uh, what? Okay, yes. So what we are looking here is a cloud notebook. So, uh, so you have system modeling uh, in the cloud as well. You don't have the graphical interface, but let's say you have created a model. So what I have done here is I've just imported the model into my cloud notebook. And then I am using the system modeling functionalities present in Mathematica to play around with how can I check my diagrams? How can I do change a parameter and simulate all those things again? So yeah, you you can, yeah. Uh, if you want to test your models you can, and want to share it with others, then you can use the cloud interface. Right, and here we got got some help from from, uh, from a user regarding the previous question, uh, and it says, "I think these are three D PDEs, partial differential equations," and and then he asked, "Does Modelica uh, handle more than one D? If it's a if it's a PDE problem, then then that's something that you could do in in uh, the Wolfram language, but the system model and and the Modelica language the system model uses." does not support that. Is system model is is used for the thing that is called 0D by some, 1D by others. I'm on the 1D side. I don't know what you are, Ankit. Um, hopefully you're on the 1D side too. Uh, but basically th things that have, uh, where you're not looking into the fine grain details in space, uh, one, one could say you're more focused on what ha happens over time things that can be described by differential equations. Um, that said, there are people doing some PDE modeling using Modelica, but that's that's really tweaking it and, and stretching it. It's not what it's intended for. Yeah, and yeah, I see, yeah, you brought up here, uh, here a bit. Because, what is, what if you want to learn a bit more about Modelica, these are really good resources. So yes, yeah, and, get... and, and also when we got this question about where can I learn about multi-body modeling, uh, like when you have those kind of questions, uh, it's a very, uh, our resources section is a very nice section to go and have a quick overview and try to search for for things. Like one thing I wanted to mention was this book. You have this computer modeling and simulation book that also has uh, some uh, has some chapters on multi-body modeling. So that can also be, could also be relevant if you want to uh, learn about it. But in general, we also have uh, recordings like we have we have had study groups in the past. And in this page, you can, uh, based on your interest, you, there is these are all one hour uh, interactive sessions that we have had before. And you can watch this recordings. Uh, uh, there are many who have found this useful. And as Sian said, uh, system model is based upon the Modelica technology. And if you are new to this term, then we have a nice, uh, what is Modelica page where with nice videos, which gives you a good understanding of the, of the technology that our tool is based on. So, but in short, uh, our resources page, I feel is, is a very good resource to start uh, browsing for materials. Thanks. Yes, and, and and I think we're running out of time from from uh, the the time we were giving given here. So, if somebody has a very fast last question, we we might answer that. Uh, otherwise, uh, I think we we'll, we're about to wrap it up and uh, hope it uh, the flight was not too bumpy for you guys uh, and that you got got some uh, some interesting information. Uh, if there are questions you didn't you you still have. You, you can, of course, join that community post uh, and, and add more questions there, and we try to answer them to that. Um, would you like to add anything more, Ankit? Uh, yes, I have the final slide of my presentation left. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. that's right. <laughs> no, yeah. So basically, yeah. Uh, if, you are, if you are from uh, like the presentation notebooks, you can find it in the community post. 
where uh, we have links to our examples section. So if you are coming from a particular domain and you want to look into specific examples from your domain, our examples page is a nice place to start with. Uh, I showed you the what's new page, but as Jan mentioned, the Wolfram U uh, web, uh, page is a very nice place to, to learn different math things related to mathematics and system modeler. But the thing that I like the most is the Wolfram, if uh, it's the Wolfram community. And we have our system modeler uh, forum there. So if you have any questions uh, or uh, you might search for uh, answers here because uh, there are like 311 discussions and maybe some questions people have already answered for you. So it's a nice place to look for past answers and also ask new questions. So I highly recommend you guys to, uh, if you have any questions, please join this group and uh, post your questions here. Yeah, that was it from my side, Jan. <laughs> Yeah, then then thanks uh, everyone and uh, me and Anket uh, wish you a good continuation of your journey. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.